I'm Jeff Yager, I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I am Vladimiro Mujica, I'm a professor of chemistry at School of Molecular Science. So Vladi, one of the questions I think, I know I get asked the most, and I'm sure uh, comes across to you as well, when I'm teaching um, almost any topic, uh, you know, what, uh, say in physical chemistry, like we're teaching now together, um, you can pick almost any topic out of there and students are very interested in, you know, what resources they need to learn, you know, a specific topic. We could pick anyone, like probably both our favorite ones, like, you know, so they'll ask me like, how did you learn entropy? How did you learn about entropy? And the one thing, you know, I will start by telling them is there is not a single textbook that I learned entropy from. You know, there's not a single resource that, in fact, I would say my knowledge of the field keeps growing and changing over time. But, but even in the beginning, when I was first trying to grapple with my understanding of a topic like entropy or any thermodynamic topic, um, I did it by grabbing a bunch of different, back then going to a library, grabbing a bunch of took, uh, books on that topic, opening up usually weeding out the ones that it didn't make any sense to me or I just didn't understand their explanations well, but I would always gravitate to not just one or two, but probably five or 10 books where I couldn't tell you one book that I like their description of entropy, but I can tell you 10 that I adore the way they discuss it in a unique way or in a, yeah. you know, et cetera. And I think it only expands with the internet and with videos. Now I can point to two or three um, people who make internet educational content as well as you know, three or four kind of open public access internet um, media or you know, data, like something like Wikipedia, yeah. et cetera, you know, as well as these books. Now I, the, the, the resources only keep growing in yeah. age of online um, teaching. They, don't, they haven't really decreased. This is true, but, uh, but I have a caveat there. I mean, it, it is true that now we have more resources than ever, both the actual physical books and whatever, you know, scientific journals, whatever we have on the internet. But it is also true, and it is a trend that we have to try to counteract as educators, as teachers, or whatever. I mean, the tradition of reading the original source and being in contact with books, either in electronic form or in physical form, this cannot be replaced by anything. Because even if you watch <coughs> videos, dozens of them, in most of these videos, I'm not saying all of them, but what you learn there is problem solving. And problem solving is an, an important part of learning physical chemistry. It, I would say a, a vital part, but it, can, it is not the whole thing. And, and, and sometimes videos can be often very good for what I would say, not quantitative, but qualitatively helping you with concepts. But by listening to somebody who can explain things in your language you know, uh, very well and articulate things and make metaphors to things, you can get a very good qualitative understanding for things. I, I, I agree. But, you know, I remember, I think it's, isn't it Stephen Hawking who's famous for saying when he was writing A Brief History of Time, like, you know, every equation, you know, drops your readership, you know, uh, an order of magnitude, right? Um, and, and sometimes I feel like, um, Today, it's getting worse, not better, as far as students' fear of mathematics. Oh, absolutely. And fear absolutely. Of, of opening books and seeing equations. Yeah. When I think the extreme opposite, which is I want, I mean, it's being able to understand mathematical equations. Yeah. That is the concise form that is the quantitative yeah, truth. You, you know, yeah. Jeff, I, I, I hope, I really hope that we are not the dying di dinosaurs in having this position. That it's really, it's, it survives because sometimes I get the impression, I mean, I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but, but we have to, to, to face the fact that uh, for many students, mathematics is an obstacle, it's a hurdle. And it is not perceived as something that helps the learning of science in a way that cannot be overemphasized. And 
whenever, you know, I remember when I was a student, I have been asked this question. Uh, Professor Mojica, tell me which chap chapter should I read to get uh, a, a B minus, a B, B grade. I say, well, of course, I don't, I, I'm not very happy with that question. So I would tell them, so, you know, if I had asked that question to one my instructor when I was a student, they would tell me, Mujica, very good question. Read the whole book. Read this second book. Perhaps even this third book. And then you will be getting close <coughs> to the type of maturity and, and understanding that you need to get your B minus. Of course, I cannot give that answer, but, but you know, it's, uh, it's kind of we have to understand that this is not just uh, what we can do, but what our students are willing to, to do in, in, in changing a certain trend. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, to be more specific, and, and I'm hoping this, by being a little more specific, it might help students. Like, we brought in today even just some, if, you know, a lot of these books are, if, if you just had me grab off my shelf, you know, some books that really made an impact when I was learning thermodynamics. Except this one, this one in mind. That's yours, yeah. Uh, and, and <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, from things like, you know, Probably, I think Prigine was one of the last to win the Nobel Prize, you know, for his non-equilibrium thermodynamics. But a really good introduction to what should be a more emphasized subject overall, which is, we say it all the time, we teach nothing but reversible equilibrium thermodynamics, yeah. but in, especially in a biological setting, the first thing then we tell students is, but we, Every biological process is almost always non-equilibrium, non-reversible. Right. If you ask me, one of the reasons what, what, what this is not considered to be basic education is because the mathematics is considered to be too difficult. Too difficult, and it is not. I mean, you, of course, you will not you will not be able to cover the whole thing about uh, entropy, you know, time-dependent entropy, which is what you need for that. You can cover a whole lot, yeah. and and that would be extremely helpful, because these these are non-equilibrium yeah. processes. Systems are out well, of equilibrium. We are out of equilibrium by a long exactly. Shot. The other thing I love about you know moving into that is it would when they if you started to do that in undergraduate you would start really realizing that kinetics and thermodynamics aren't so separate from each other. That there is just a time dependence to kinetics that we don't do in equilibrium thermodynamics, but comes very important in non-equilibrium. And it really marriages those two in a way that you only see when you go on to those levels, yep. you know. Um, you know, another thing I think that's incredibly uh, critical, and you know, I'm very biased because um, I do Brion spectroscopy named after uh, Leon Brion, which is uh, scattering off of acoustic phonons uh, in systems. But, um, you know, he wrote a book that is, I, I think, very underappreciated that brings, you know, simply, you know, when you're trying to understand a complex topic like entropy, looking at it from different perspectives, looking at it from the historical one, from kind of heat engines, what I call the engineering perspective, not knowing what heat is at a molecular level and just being able to try to deduce its properties. That's kind of how I think of it as classically taught. Mm -hmm. Then after Boltzmann, people started doing it in a more molecular, statistical mechanics way, bringing it from first principles, from microscopic theories, um, et cetera. But, you know, it's underappreciated how entropy is central in the theory of information yeah. and how you can completely approach it as its probability of a certain information. Absolutely, and, and when you approach it that way, then you realize that entropy increase is deeply connected to the loss of information. Yes, yeah. You know something about a system, and then you know less. Yeah, in and fact, the, he, Knowing you less, know, you can actually translate yeah. into entropy being increased. Yeah, Brion, even uh, he even in his book, he, he advocates for be calling neg entropy, negative yeah. entropy, right. for just that reason. And then, um, you know, even in classical thermodynamics, though, there's, you know, I bring just a couple, you know, like this one in equilibrium thermodynamics, but there's one like Dimby's book in, um, uh, that goes through, I want to say it's called Chemical Equilibria, is Denby's book, where he does nothing but spend all the time with what is typically just one chapter on chemical equilibria, but he goes through 
much more complicated chemical equilibrium cases where you not just have one or two things in equilibrium, you might have five or six or seven. And in today's modern age of computers, that should be trivial. We shouldn't have any problem going up to five or six things in equilibrium with each other. It's hard to work by hand, but yeah, it's but definitely computer, never hard on a computer, right? Which brings us to another important point. I mean, the use of computers, of course, we cannot argue with that. I mean, we need them. Right. But trying to replace the type of basic knowledge that you will acquire in a course like this or, or you know, something else in basic thermodynamics and think that you can replace that by number crunching, that's a mistake. So it's, we need the computer. Without them, we cannot really treat uh, real systems. But to think, you know, Coulson, I think, uh, was the one who said, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry too, but, and then uh, he said, give me understandings, understanding don't give me numbers, which is an extreme. Right, yeah. You know, thing. View of things, but yeah. And, and there are people who have other extremes, like a good example would be uh, Bridgman, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on pressure. Um, you know, uh, his book on thermodynamics, um, you know, really emphasizes, he had a huge emphasis on it not being real if it doesn't relate to experiment. If, if you can't make a theory that has testable predictions that you can test with real experiment, which has been a hallmark of a lot of um, theory and a lot of debate with things like string theory and others that don't have uh, uh, testable predictions. I always also think it's, it's amazing that almost all the pillars in quantum mechanics, like uh, Schrodinger, um, you know, like Einstein, you know, like Max Planck, have thermodynamics texts. Right. And they're all and Probably we want to mention that Schrodinger, who has his book on statistical mechanics, he, ho he also has a fantastic book that's called What is Life? Yes, yeah. Because he was one of the first thinkers who realized that you couldn't possibly describe biological systems, you know, on an atom, an atom. Without. Basis. So, Without. so you needed statistical mechanics. He was not right about uh, what were the carries of genetic information, but that's... No. Uh, that's uh, but that was really far... Uh, well, yeah. and the other one I think that gets underestimated, which is, you know, uh, a lot of times you can we all want to make personal connections to the math, to the science. And so, you know, going back and, and learning some about these people and stuff, and, you know, so much gets made about, you know, the, the Bohr-Einstein, you know, things. And, and there's so many novels and videos made about that, but very little about Schrodinger versus Heisenberg. But, you know, they were very, they were characters and they had much different personalities. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot, uh, to be seen there as well. The other thing I like to mention is, you know, most of all these texts, whether it be Hill's beautiful book on small systems, you know, classic ones like Lewis and Randall or, or Pimentel, who was a famous mm -hmm. lecturer at Berkeley, um, Gibbs himself, you know, um, how can you not know that or, or Fermi? Um, you know, all of these books are typically either Dover books or, or older books. A lot of these are very cheap. I mean, all of them you can get for, you know, 50 bucks if you're willing to get used, maybe even a little cheaper. Um, you know, most of them are five or ten dollar books. And so um, and while, you know, it's it's very, you know, common now just to get digital versions, I would just say from my own personal experience, I can more efficiently kind of thumb through yeah, to have the these, feeling of a physical you know, book. Uh, I can thumb it's through it and kind we, of some of us find. Yeah, I, I can have four or five of those open at the same time. And For instance, this one that you know that I that I showed to you. This this today, is yeah. Chandra Sekhar. Chandra Sekhar, you know, it's a physicist. He was became a, extremely famous by his studies of stars and thermodynamics on their uh, relativistic conditions, because this is something that we haven't talked about here. Yeah. But if we are going to talk about thermodynamics of a star, we need to take into account that relativity, relativity is there. So this has a fantastic chapter on a formulation of thermodynamics that was due to a mathematician by the name of Carathiori. That is absolutely beautiful. It's a little bit hard from a mathematical point of view, 
but it actually, you know, when it comes to integrating factor and the definition of entropy, it actually shows that 1 over t is the universal factor for entropy, which is a huge thing. Yeah, well, and we let's face it, now with what you just said earlier too, with computers, especially with the modern software for what I would call symbolic um, expression of mathematics and, you know, where you don't have to do everything numerically. You can do things in a sense on a computer analytically, Mathematica famously and others. I mean, even if you struggle with some of the very kind of complicated mathematics, there are, there are real packages to help with that so that then you can use these things in a much more elegant, you know, way. So I, I you know, I think we're in a era too that, you know, um, computers can really assist with keeping things at that fundamental, you know, mathematical level. But without replacing thinking and concepts. Yeah, yeah. Never. They Never, no, but... Unless they, when they become better than, than, than we are, you know, we are... No, but they, 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 often, they often definitely help with, instead of having oh, to have the book of table oh, of integrals, right? Absolutely. Like, you know, instead absolutely. of having to remember every absolutely. integral identity... And if you use a symbolic package, like you said... As it a, just as simplifies. As Mathematica, yeah. it's... It's a huge simplification. You can actually do things analytically yeah. to a large extent. So, yeah, and um, the other one I like to mention, which, you know, they, they have one uh, called SciMath, I think it's called, which is completely online. So you don't have to buy it, install it or anything. It's just in browser, write the equation, it, and it'll help solve and stuff. In fact, I give links to it because, you know, I use it even personally to check my mathematics a lot. You know, I, I always encourage students to never get caught, um, you know, making simple mistakes because now computers can check those right. so easily for you. So, well, thanks for the discussion today, um, Vladi, and I hope students out there find this uh, illuminating or at least maybe giving you some additional strategies when you're trying to learn material that you're having difficulties with. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.